for me, this is uh, a very familiar location with a very unfamiliar view. Uh, that would be the one-line summary. And certainly your presence here has dropped the average age in this hall by about 30 years, <laughs> if not more. Uh, and in a sense, uh, it is uh, already a pleasure to be in that kind of company, the kind of insights and interests that you all represent, your ambitions, your emotions, your possibly fears, your concerns. I think they're very welcome inputs to what we also do here on a daily basis. People often refer to this hall as a chambre de réflexion, a chamber of reflection. Let me let you in on a little secret. It doesn't really happen that often. And we are much too busy doing the day-to-day, -day, or week-to-week -week in our case, job that we are asked to do, and there's really very little time, perhaps too little time left for the kind of reflection that we probably should engage in much more often and much more profoundly. So in that sense, I think you're setting a very good and appropriate example for me and my colleagues when we sit here and to a large extent worry about issues that are related to the concerns that you have voiced this afternoon. Because surely also from where we sit and from what we have to do, it is I think pretty clear that the world is changing at a very rapid rate and that technology changes are behind that. And those technology changes, that technology that is exploding in a way does not explode into a vacuum. It is in a very real sense, as several people have pointed out, a cultural artifact. Technology defines our culture, our culture defines the technology that we can put together and think of. And everything indicates that we are in a period of very rapid and unpredictable transition. And as it concerns you, it also concerns the part-time politicians that we are one day a week. Um, and as we sit and ponder, uh, each of us involved in his own way, I think the one concern that we all have and that you probably will recognize right away is simply the, the question whether or not the rate of change that our democratic systems are able to accomplish can match up with the rate of change that the technology confronts us with. And uh, I'm certainly myself involved in many of the political debates that emanate from the technology change, both here and at the European level. And the very real concern that we all have is that whenever we think we have found a solution, the problem has already changed beyond recognition. And that in and of itself, I think, sets the stage for what I want to, to share with you here. because. The one-line summary, really, of what I am about to say is that we really need help. And we need your help, help from people like you. If you, if you want to think about what the ethical impact of this ongoing industrial revolution is or might be, then it occurred to me, listening to all of you, that it might be useful to look back on the previous big industrial revolution and to figure out what we have learned from that one. And this was a revolution that took place more or less in the time of this particular king. This is, by the way, William II, not William I, as many people think. So around 1850 or so, the industrial revolution started to reach the Netherlands, and it had an enormous impact in many, many ways. And the very reason that you call it a revolution is already indicative of what happened, because what revolutions basically do, wherever they occur, they change the distribution of power. And that is what this particular industrial revolution also did. And when you have an industrial revolution of that type, then it creates opportunities for rapid change, and as a result, it creates newly powerful people and newly powerless people. And that is precisely what happened in the 19th century, in the late 19th century. And society had the challenge to cope with that development. And basically, I think what we tried to accomplish then is to look at the powerful and to make sure that they were properly encouraged and to look at the powerless 
and to make sure that they were properly protected. And both roles are really crucial because the powerful are powerful because of one very good reason, the change that they represent is possibly a very positive and potentially very rewarding one. So that is the kind of change we want to encourage. We want to make sure that it happens and that it happens rapidly. And at the same time, a civilized society, like the one we want to be, wants to make sure that the powerless, the newly powerless, the people whose life are changed, not for the positive but for the negative, are properly protected and taken along. And of course, what happens everywhere and also here is that both categories organize themselves. The powerful organize themselves, become employers, employ huge amounts of people, make sure that their interests are well represented and perhaps even more visibly. And luckily, the powerless organized themselves and became the trade unions and made sure that their interests were indeed properly protected going forward. So, if that is a very brief summary of what happened in the previous Industrial Revolution, the question, of course, is how these lessons apply today. Uh, and if you look at the way in which these organizations functioned, it strikes me, looking backward, that, of course, the employers focused on the properly part and made sure that, indeed, they could make the changes and accomplish the progress that they had in mind. And the powerless, the trade unions, are focused on the protection part and made sure that people did not get hurt unnecessarily. Now, capitalism, capitalism that's been around for such a long time, is changing once again. The last speaker coined the phrase surveillance capitalism, that I think is at least one feature of it, one very nice way to formulate it. The machines that were built in the 19th century were controllable for a long time, but they seem to be somewhat less controllable these days, or we are losing some control over what they could or might accomplish. And as a society, it seems to me that we have a similar role to fulfill and organize, to encourage on one hand and to protect on the other hand. Both roles, I think, are really necessary and both are complex. And if we try to learn from that previous revolution, then um, I would argue that many of the really positive changes that have come about as a result, and that were hard fought and hard won, came as the result of the input and efforts of two subcategories. On one hand, there were the what I would like to call enlightened innovators. And on the other hand, there were visionary protectors. And these two roles, I think, are just as necessary today as they were then, about a century ago. Enlightened innovators, employers who realized that to make progress, just driving for profit could not be the only role that they had to play, but that they had to carry out that mission in a civilized fashion and take people along, accomplishing those new goals. And visionary protectors who realized that protection was not a short-term struggle, but a long-term battle at the end of the day, leading to a coalition with the enlightened producers that they were initially just fighting. And that kind of coalition, I think, is what we would like to see happen today. And obviously, the enlightened innovators would and should be people like you. That is the role I hope all of you will consider playing. Enlightened innovators who begin by wondering and questioning what the impact of their efforts could be, what uh, gains there could be, and what risks there could be equally and equally crucially. So, going forward, what can you do to play that role as you set out to conquer the world, to build your teams, to lead them to victory in whatever struggle you're engaged in? And of course, one of the things that you can do, and I hopefully will do, is to, to read the books that were recommended to you, to listen to the TED Talks, 
uh, to continue your conversations. But there is perhaps something beyond that that I would like to suggest, and that also was part of some of the earlier presentations. And that is to occasionally at least step back from the rush of innovation, from the adrenaline of innovation, as exciting as it is, and ask yourself at least a few basic questions. The questions like, how will this great product really affect the world that we live in? And whose interests are we really serving when we develop it and take it to the market? And whose interests might be violated when we do and if we do under the conditions that we tend to do it in? And how confident can we really be that the power to effect all those interests rests in the right hands? Those questions, I would like to suggest, are pretty down-to-earth translations of what ethical impact, what ethical efforts would imply in this particular world that we find ourselves in. And to answer those questions, I would also like to suggest that you, listening to, again, some of the speakers, reflect on the kind of co collaboration, the kind of teams, the kind of team composition that you really need. And I would like to suggest that in many situations, the teams that you work with can gain both relevance and quality if you open them to a larger diversity of opinions than is typically found there. Technology is much too important to be left to technologists. There are many, many disciplinary backgrounds that can really help you gather a perspective on what you're about to do and accomplish that can really help you and ultimately help the world in which your ideas will ultimately land. So a diversity of opinions and some basic questions every now and then worth thinking about and answering. Ethics, uh, somebody said at some point, is a conversation, but it's not a conversation about everything. It's a conversation about uncomfortable questions like these. And the more uncomfortable you feel thinking about them, the more necessary <coughs> it is to worry about them. So I hope, going forward, that you will do as the enlightened innovators did in the 19th century. Organize yourselves. Organize yourselves. Make sure you keep in touch with each other and with your fellow innovators in this hall and outside the hall. And learn from your experience. Be ready to learn from what works and especially from what fails, because inevitably there will be failures next to the great successes that I hope, trust, and wish all of you will be part of. Thank you. Thank you very much.